Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, this <coughs> session is about transforming, uh, transforming from traditional IT to the cloud, transforming into a cloud native uh, organization. And the idea is that there's a lot of conversation about what is cloud native, but it's sort of hard to put your finger on what does it actually mean? How does one actually get to that ideal or that place uh, within an organization? And the way that we would like to uh, organize this is that we have a panel of people um, whom I'll introduce very shortly. But the one thing I want to take care of first is I want to know more about what do we have in the audience? Who are the people that are, that are here? And so if you could just do a quick raise of hands. Um, how many are here from a, what should we, how should we categorize this? A to be transformed. <laughs> a to be transformed organization. And how many are here from the standpoint of I'm a developer and I need to transform an application? And how many are coming at it from a business perspective as in we are looking? So it's a good mix. What Those else am I missing? Who else would be here? Who's here because they're in the wrong room? <laughs> <laughs> could, could we ask a couple more questions about this? For the people that are looking to transform workloads into cloud, um, into more cloud native, what are the biggest obstacles that you're encountering right now? What, what are the class of applications that you're looking to transform? Security, a good example. Another? Is it just security related? I'm sorry? ERPs, so uh, shared database driven applications, um, like SAP, SAP, SAP. any other, I'm sorry? Web apps. Web apps, that's much easier. Okay. <laughs> so the two main things that we'd like to cover, and I'm going to first introduce everyone. So all the way over on the left is Ulf. Ulf is the, um, He's in charge of the operations for the HP Public Cloud, which runs on OpenStack. And so his perspective will be from a very operational perspective and how do you get this thing running and how do you keep one running. Um, in the middle we have Matthias, who is a chief cloud technologist who works with the Helium product. Um, he's, in, he's based in Europe here and spends a lot of time with customers with this very question. And then we have Michael Day, who is our I, help me, director of cloud evangelical so, so <laughs> developers. I, so I manage technical partnerships and evangelism for uh, HP Helium. Okay. So. so the two things that we really want to try to get everybody to walk away with is here are the things that people are actually looking at here, what customers and partners are looking at in the transformation. As in what I mean by that is these are specific applications and workloads that, they, that they're looking at. The second thing that we'd really like everyone to take away is that we have broken it into categories of how one actually migrates the application, whether it be to the cloud or whether it be into a cloud native environment. So the format is interrupt at any time, talk as much as you want. It means that we have to talk less. Um, I'll ha I have some slides that I have created for this that I'll basically give in, these in certain chunks and then I'm going to ask specific questions to the panel. But again, just if there's any question at any time, please feel free to involve yourself and interrupt as you need. So what does it mean to go cloud native? On a very simple level, becoming cloud native means that you're burning the ships. It's, you can't go back. Cloud native from this perspective means that your data resides in the cloud itself and the services of the application, they also reside in the cloud. It's basically, it's an encompassing place. But what this means is that you have burned the ships. There is no going back. You're not gonna get back on the ship and go home. Once you move to this place, this is where you're going to be. So I'm gonna turn this to the panel and I'm going to basically ask the question, what does cloud native mean to the customers that you speak with? What does cloud native mean to operate from the public cloud? And from the developer perspective, what does that mean to be in a cloud native environment?
exists already in a traditional environment and just try, trying to deploy it in the cloud. But they recognize that they also need to have the right thought leaders, the right developers, the right organizational structure, the right tools to develop and deploy and test, and then monitor what's happening in, in that public cloud environment, um, whereas the application was in their own infrastructure before. So it's those that, that make those choices well, those that think about all these different dimensions, those are the ones that I see being successful. <coughs> From a business point of view, I I talk more as a cloud chief technologist with C-levels, so CIOs, CFOs, who not worry about the technical details, but um, they perceive cloud native as a, as a threat, uh, very often as a challenge, because they see this... Um, uh, and also I'm detecting the interfaces, because a lot of interfaces have grown over the past five years, and those who have grown them have left the company. So sometimes uh, it's a very tough thing to move such a beast into the cloud. However, you could consider to move uh, things under the umbrella of a cloud, of a hybrid cloud, to propagate all the nice business attributes. As I said, CFOs, they don't know where there's app on the keyboard only because there's a printing on top of it, they know how to place it. Therefore, they don't care about these things, but they care about the nice advantages of the cloud that they can burst into things, which means that they do not have to pay for any kind of slack space. They can have real-time reporting. They have a drill-down feature to look into things. They are no longer the pathologist who knows everything but six weeks too late. These are also advantages where you can think about what does your SAP system do, what are the requirements from a technology point, and then let's find the best, if possible, hybrid or if possible cloud native solution. But it depends significantly on what you have done with that SAP system over the past 10 years, and I know what that means, I'm a certified sub-consultant. Michael. So, um, I actually have a, a slight additional question. How many of you guys are familiar with the, with the argument around pets and cattle? All right. How many of you are looking to move pets into cloud native applications? Make pets into cattle. So, so the bad news is that um, it's rare that your pet is ever going to become a cattle. And there's a fundamental reason for this, right? At, at the design level, at the architecture level of the application. Cattle are engineered so that they tolerate failure in the system. And pets, on the other hand, are not. And so pets tolerate different types of failure. Let me put it that way. They tolerate failure through other mechanisms. So I actually believe that, uh, as much as Jerry said, every application, the goal for every application is not necessarily to get it to become cloud native. The goal uh, is to implement on top of a cloud platform. And uh, within that platform, there are various levels, various technologies, various strategies that you can use um, to segment, to contain, um, to provide high availability and resiliency. Um, and those technologies are implemented differently for, I, I don't like the term pets and cattle. Um, I like to call them highly managed workloads or lightly managed workloads, right? Cattle, cattle run uh, without regard for failure at core parts of, the, of a cloud system because they're architected to have no single point of failure. Pets, on the other hand, frequently do have single points of failure um, that, are, that have additional specialized capabilities thrown at them um, to prevent them from going down. So, I, it, so it's, it's not like you're going to have a machine to uh, put your pet in the machine, you punch some numbers, and then open the door and out pops cap. Um, but there are various strategies that you can employ to, for example, contain, uh, to uh, compartmentalize that workload, and then to virtualize that workload on top of a cloud resource pool. Um, and there are, uh, you can, in some cases, you can actually segment a workload. So there was a question about uh, web workloads, moving web workloads onto uh, the cloud. Well, web is one of the easiest ones to move because it's a, it's a, it's a stateless interface. 
And so if you move your interface into, uh, into a cattle metaphor, then you have your back-end system, the, the back-end of your web service, right? that is implemented as a pet and is managed as a highly managed workflow, um, then you can, through compartmentalization and containment, you can actually manage that as a more native cloud workload. But truly, truly cloud native workloads happen at architecture. They don't happen, uh, they don't happen by migration. They happen by re-architecting. I think that was a comment. Well, I was going to say, I was uh, saying that we were looking to move the web, web apps. That's the first thing. Sure. Sure, we would like to work, move a lot of things as well. We would like to move some pets. Uh, trying to start the web apps just to see how it works. Yeah. Yeah, because it's easiest. And, and that's what a lot of, I mean, in, in the customer set that I engage with, most customers, when they're looking at OpenStack, they're looking at it as a way to manage web workloads initially. Um, because those are the ones that, quite frankly, OpenStack was initially conceived to manage. Um, the issue is that then after they get a good experience with that, and many customers have fantastic experiences with that, um, then the next thing is, well, I want to use this for, for more stuff. Right? I want to use this for more highly managed workloads. And, um, and that's when you have to be strategic about how you're, how you're uh, containing different types of functionality that are dependent on specialized hardware or specialized infrastructure or, um, or you know, a specialized uh, software component, like, for example, Oracle or you know, some very highly managed database. Um, or if, you're, uh, if you can you know, migrate other selected portions of it, basically contain the, the highly managed workload, contain the lightning managed workload in different operating contexts. That's a very good segue into the next compete. We, we have one more question. Oh. Actually, um, I mean, the, the big story of HP is obviously hyper right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the issue. Absolutely. Right. Exactly. So I would be interested in, I mean, you said before you can never move it back, but obviously the idea is that you have the job ability and portability and you can basically choose across models. Yes. Yep. And then you just stuff around that field dynamically. Yep. Private cloud is as good as a cloud model, as public cloud. Exactly. And I think that term cloud data for meaning is all in the public cloud is very important. Well, so. And, and, I would and, never, I, and, I, and I wouldn't talk about being cloud native as in a public cloud. If it's, it could be private. There's, there's no question. It's just about like it's, it's a cloud, um, not necessarily this, that, on-prem, off-prem. That, that would have very little to do with being cloud native to me because when you look at some of the customers and, and some of the, and some of what people are doing, um, take Netflix for example, they have pieces of their of their delivery that are completely cloud native. You know. And it's crazy how cloud native are, but they also have components and they have workloads that have nothing to do with the cloud. And they have both private and they, they use both private and public clouds, but they use their own private cloud that has, that doesn't even talk to the public cloud, which is generally Amazon in their case. So you made a you made a number of points that I think were worth calling out uh, as you know additional high high value points, right? First one is that um, I believe that if you if you try to make everything into one thing or another thing, you're going to fail, right? Especially in the case of of, enterprise, of legacy enterprise workloads, um, they're architected for a reason. They're architected to be 
uh, a specific design. They were done with best of breed technology at the time, but they were architected. Many. There's always exceptions to this. But, but from my perspective, I always start with a do no harm kind of approach, right? And if these workloads are truly critical for a business, and they can be offered in a different delivery model, um, and they and offering those in a different delivery model with a different set of technologies adds value to the company, um, then transforming them into more cloud native may make sense. Um, otherwise, there are these other strategies that I talked about: containment, segmentation, yeah. virtualization. So we're going to talk a little bit more about which workloads and specifically how you can move and when could not move some of them. But I want to move forward just sure. here. Um, as we know, not all great players, although you know, that could be argued, I guess, not all players um, are necessarily great coaches. In the same way, not all workloads are meant to go to the cloud. So what I'm showing up there is these are the top 10 workloads that we see deployed in the cloud today. And if you look at these 10, the thing that got interest that was the most interesting for me from the data is that the top five of them are all born in the cloud. And the bottom five are enabled or bolted on or integrated into the cloud. And this starts pointing to the question of which workloads do exist, which workloads should be in the cloud. So, so the question that I that I am going to pose to the panel on this particular thing is, these are very high level categories and not even necessarily of an application or a workload itself. But in your experience from the different perspectives that you have, what do you see as being the top workloads that should or should not be moved to the cloud? And what are the impacts and challenges of those, either from a technical standpoint or an operational standpoint? I think uh, I want to step in here. One of the reasons why transformations fail are because they are technology driven. Because you want to move things that are in the cloud, and you want to move it because it's a, it fits so nicely in the cloud. Your biggest problem is the business who has to agree with this transformation. And they follow a principle, if I translate my German background, as saying they want to get washed, but do not want to get wet. So, German phrase is, wasch mich aber mach mich nicht nass. So the, the point is that the business needs a reason to accept any kind of change, and it must have an advantage for them. If you come and say, I want to move because there's open stack, in the old days it was I have to move from server 2000 to 2003, or from Linux, uh, whatever reason, uh, 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 release, that is not a business reason, and they would strongly object to it. So when I classify my candidates for a transformation, I look at two parameters. The one is, what's the technology fit? So you have things that are inheritance, old stuff, and you have things that is absolutely new, or you have even a cloud version or cloud native version of that application, and I look at the business impact. The things that have a heavy business impact, you will never ever get an acceptance by the business to transform that first. <coughs> because they will not say that I put the critical items of my business as guinea pig for you techies to find out how to run that cloudy thing. They are accepting that you use things that are easy to be moved, that's why web, uh, things are easy, or if you have a cloud native version. These things are moved because they have a low business impact and they have a low technology impact. And they also have a low security impact and data privacy impact. Then the business is willing to say, yes, we can't stand in the way of the evolution of technology. That is your playground. And then you can attack those things that have a low business impact, but hinder the business because they are old. That's quite a volume. And with that volume, you can make, first of all, the money to pay for this whole exercise. And you have the single chance to build up the experience and also the belief and the trust of the business that you can do. Because, first of all, they don't think that you can do it because you've shown in the past that you've failed. I don't want to say that you can't do, but unfortunately failure remembers better in our brain than success. And therefore, once you have achieved that, then you can address the business critical items 
Therefore, the ERP system that is running the main core business of your environment, of your enterprise, will never show up on the first line, and honestly, I wouldn't touch it. I would first see that all the processes go through. And this is also a very important thing. We have to deal with human beings. When we talk about availability, we invest millions, and companies are extremely willing to invest millions in hardware resilience, you know, four high-speed data connectivities between four data centers across the universe, the geostationary satellite bed up system, they want to spend that money. But that covers only a fifth of all the failures. Half of the failures is human error of the programmer. But we invest not in that. We invest in hardware <coughs> because it's so easy to understand. And we save the money in having the operations done by untrained offshore personnel and the development is done by people who can't read our language. Amazing that we put 80% of the availability into a flaky hands and invest, invest tons in something that's just hardware. So this is also something we have to think about. When I hear about security, if you look at the last security breaches and the biggest one that is currently in the press, Mr. Snowden, which I personally am very happy that he did it, but there was no technology breach. This guy just took the data and moved it out. So when we look about transformation, it's first of all, we have to have transformation crew, we have to have a good transformation concept, and we have to have a business-oriented classification, not a technology classification. Yeah, I think that, um, I think I would take a slightly different take on that. And, uh, I mean, I understand the validity of your argument around uh, addressing business needs first. And I think I would double-click on that. So, there are, a variety of, there are a variety of business needs that are not satisfied with legacy technology. And so the, the way that you're able to address, for example, having a, a, a global deployment of your application that satisfies multiple different audiences, that's hosted out of different countries, is through a cloud model. And so, so, so the, fun, the fundamental way to address the business need is to use new technologies. And for those types of situations, I think that you can make a case, um, and many companies do make this case, uh, that implementing uh, a solution on top of those technologies is critical to their business, and therefore they invest in the technology. I do think I, I do think that your point about I have a legacy application, and I and it's so critical to my business that I can't move it is a valid one. And that's what I was trying to get at with the do no harm kind of comment. That those technologies will migrate over time um, to use new technologies. For example, SAP is part of OpenStack now. I don't know if you knew that. Um, they've joined OpenStack. Um, they're looking at how they use Ironic um, to deploy uh, SAP solutions in cloud, but with a cloud resourcing model, with a cloud management model. Um, these types of, of solutions will naturally gravitate toward technology that offers them an advantage. And um, so I do think that there, there are fundamental business drivers that can be addressed in cloud that are not addressed in legacy technology. And that's where that critical intersection is where um, cloud becomes a focus for deployment. That's where they can satisfy a need that is not met with existing technology. Let me answer this on a different part of the spectrum. Um, so what I see as the operator of a public cloud is um, well, what, what works and what doesn't work. And uh, what I don't see is the upstream decision making process of my customers. They, you know, I only know about them once they show up in my store. But those that are successful are, and that have reasonably large deployments, uh, large means north of 200 VMs, north of 5,000 VMs. Those that uh, operate at that scale and are successful are always the ones that came to me before they made the deployment decision and asked, how does your thing work? What are your fault domains? What services should I be using? What single points of failure do you have? So that's, that's, that's the, the ops answer. <laughs> I'll give you an example. There's a company that I, I'm doing quite a lot of work with right now that is, uh, they have they have their own version of a legacy workload, and some people might consider it to be pretty advanced, but it's, uh, it's a very, very high compute 
a very, very compute intensive workload that was traditionally deployed on bare metal Linux. And so, and I'm not talking about just a few nodes, I'm talking about thousands of nodes. So uh, they have this solution, they use it every day, they generate tons of money out of it, it is the heart of their business. And they're not waiting to try to, uh, to try to migrate it. They are literally taking a containment approach and they're using uh, Mesos uh, along with a container technology to deploy this as a bare metal workload in the context of the cloud. Um, obviously there are problems around this, right? The parallelization of the, of the technology is a problem. But having that cloud resourcing model and having that cloud deployment model using in conjunction with a container technology and using it with a with a scheduling technology, they're using two. They're using uh, they're using Mesos uh, as a scheduler, and they're also using a, a thing called HT H, HT Condor, uh, which is a, a high volume scheduler. And so, I mean, these technologies, uh, their their approach is very innovative, and um, and they'll realize instantly um, business benefit in doing this. Um, but it is a very, very legacy cloud work. They're just they're tolerating failure at the node level. <coughs> they're saying, well, I'm gonna if I if I have a problem with this, I'm gonna throw out all the results, and I'm, it's a very um, MapReduce kind of uh, centric view. Right? I'm gonna throw everything out from that node, and I'm gonna reschedule that particular node. Yeah, on the slide, the question. So I'm I'm interested why we classify number six web applications under the line. And then maybe the second question is the one that is on top, so DevOps. Um, I, maybe I'm, I'm reading this wrong, but I would see it more as a way to deliver workloads. So yep. the work yep. itself. So could you clarify the reason you have? So it's a nuance. Um, there's, um, there's microservices uh, focused architectures, there's SOA focused architectures, there are legacy three tier web application focused architectures. and. Some of these are more suitable to cloud deployment than others, right? Some of them are, are less dependent on uh, highly managed uh, back-end infrastructure than others are. And so I actually think that web applications should both be on top of the line and below the, below the line. Depending on how you're in one Sure. Language dependencies, uh, underlying infrastructure dependencies, dependencies on, uh, you know, you may have a, a web-focused application that has some really specific networking dependencies. Um, you may have web-focused applications that have real specific security dependencies. Um, and whenever, and, and it kind of depends on when they were architected and what the, what the approach was and what the underlying uh, implementation was, right? Um, but certainly, I mean, there are web workloads that it's so drop-dead obvious that they're cloud-native um, that you know, they should be on the top of the line as well. At the number one level, what the, what that is really speaking to is when you is the test environment. What does that test environment look like in a CI C D or in a DevOps piece? The reason that web apps when I read through and in, in, in creating and looking at the data in my research, the reason that web apps actually falls down there is because a lot of times what you see, and it's true of everything on the in the bottom of this, the ROI of re-architecting a particular legacy application doesn't make sense to take it into a cloud native space. As opposed to, as what Michael's talking about, is sort of let's just contain it. Let's, let's, let's draw the line around it and basically say, okay, the investment that we're going to do into this particular web application is very minimal. We need to get it to the cloud, into a cloud native space when we can. However, it might be so optimized within a VM in a traditional workload that moving it to the cloud might result in a very small, a very insignificant amount of return on that investment. In which case, leave it. It's doing just fine. It's not going down. And that, you know, the comment was made earlier, we don't do this because we can. We do it when, because it's the right thing to do. And I think that that's what you're seeing in that distinction there. And the ERP is another one that's very, that's more of the classic one we talk about. Very complex systems that are highly optimized in the VM environment, let's just leave them. They're fine there. And at the next opportunity, let's talk about what it means to move it to either into that hybrid environment 
or a cloud native space, what, and what, whatever that might mean to the organization. Yeah, question. Yeah. 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 predicting further than three years anything. Uh, first of all, because predictions that they point into the future are always very tri tricky. Second thing is, if you go back five years, the tablet was not existing. If you look now into the audience, everybody has a tablet. So it means that we so I, have... A I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt them, and I, and I don't want to stop the conversation, but, I'm, but we have to stop the conversation. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Um, there's clearly there's a lot of conversation here. I'm sorry that we didn't get deeper into this, but thank you everyone for attending. Thank you everybody on the panel, and um, I guess we'll now begin the conversation after. Well, and I'll throw out a plug. Um, there's a session tomorrow um, that I'm hosting with Intel and with Oracle uh, around pets versus cattle and how we depolarize that conversation and how we get enterprise workloads moved into cloud as well. If it if it interests you, please come to that session. Thanks.